Today we're here with Dr. Blake Richards from the University of Toronto, Department of Biological Sciences. Blake, thanks so much for letting us come by and visit your lab today. My pleasure, thanks for coming. So Blake, your uh, research focuses in the area of learning and memory. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to share with us a little bit about your research areas and some of the th things that you're looking at? Sure. So, uh, as you mentioned, my lab studies the neurophysiology of learning and memory. And this is something that I find particularly interesting because I really think that learning and memory is what makes us who we are in many ways. So if you think about it, um, the brain is arguably one of the most sophisticated computational devices on the planet. There's many things that we can do that even the most advanced artificial intelligence applications can't do to date. Uh, and yet this isn't because of the hardware that we possess. Neurons in our brain are quite a bit slower than the circuits that exist in modern digital computers, and we don't have as much memory capacity. Um, so despite some of the energy efficiency of our brains, really, we seem to be at a hardware disadvantage compared to computers, and yet we can do all these things that they can't. And the reason for that really comes down to our ability to learn just about anything. The brain is a general purpose learning device, and that is what really gives us the computational power that we have. If you think about it, most of the things that we do in our lives, whether it be riding a bike, writing an essay, programming a computer, etc., these are things that our ancestors did not have any access to in the evolutionary environment. So there's something that we learned over the course of our lives. And that general purpose learning capability of the brain is really powerful and really fascinating. And arguably, um, often, uh, many of the diseases that might exist uh, for, uh, for the brain, such as autism or schizophrenia, might in fact be impairments in these learning mechanisms. So if we understand the neurophysiology of learning and memory a bit more, we might be able to help to treat many of the most complicated neurological diseases that exist. Additionally, we might actually be able to develop new artificial intelligence applications that can learn some of the things that, uh, that we can that currently computers can't. Um, so my lab uh, is interested in looking at the cellular level, how do connections between neurons change based upon experience? Quite, sounds quite interesting and fascinating. Um, so in neuroscience, there's many different types of uh, technologies and methods available, and perhaps one of the more high profile and interesting ones in the last several years is optogenetics. Uh, share a little bit about how your lab uses optogenetics and what are some of the things that it allows that maybe weren't possible before? So optogenetics has really changed the landscape of neuroscience research to some extent, uh, particularly in electrophysiology. So if you're going to study any circuit, whether it be a neural circuit or an electrical circuit, ideally, in order to understand how the circuit works, you want to be able to control the signals that are being sent along the circuit and see what the outputs are with different input signals. Um, historically, this was very difficult to do in the brain uh, except at the most basic sensory level. We could give animals different sensory inputs, but there was no way to control the signals that were actually occurring inside the brain of a living animal. And uh, now with optogenetics, though, we have this ability. Optically, we can change the electrical activity in different circuits, uh, and in particular in different genetically defined sub-circuits. Uh, additionally, with uh, patterned optical illumination technologies, we now have the ability to also control electrical activity in spatially identified circuits with very high temporal resolution. And in this way, we can work out how neurons respond to different input signals. So these are the sorts of things my lab's using optogenetics for. Now, and one of the tools that you're using uh, is from us, the Polygon 400. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share a little bit about how you use the Polygon 400 to help aid in some of these uh, research goals? Sure. So, for example, one of our studies right now is examining uh, sensory codes in the neocortex. And uh, so neurons send electrical signals to each other with these short impulses in voltage called spikes. And we're interested in understanding how different patterns of spikes can encode different information that's interpreted by downstream circuits in different ways. So in order to study this, what we need to do is we need to be able to control the activity of individual cells in a living circuit uh, such that we create different patterns of spikes at different times in order to encode the information differently and then see how that information is propagated through the circuit. But you can only do this if you can somehow stimulate individual cells at specific points in time. 
And this is what we use the Polygon 400 pattern illuminator for. We go and we do our recordings in a cell that's receiving a bunch of inputs. And those inputs, are, we drive with the Polygon by identifying particular cells and then activating them in different patterns. Okay, quite interesting. And you've been uh, working with the Polygon for about a year or so mm -hmm. now. Um, what's your experience like been working with MyTex so far? Working with MyTex has been fantastic. Um, we have found the Polygon 400 to be an invaluable tool and being able to actually uh, interact with the engineers who made it has been uh, incredibly invaluable itself. Uh, we've, we've really enjoyed being able to come and talk to you guys and work through things and troubleshoot with you. We found everyone at MyTex um, extremely knowledgeable and extremely helpful. And uh, we really feel that uh, our research has advanced at a much more rapid pace by, enable, by being able to have this direct interaction. Um, additionally, we hope that uh, uh, we've at least given something back to you guys with regards to our feedback and some knowledge of the sorts of questions that neurophysiologists are interested in. And this sort of back and forth between us, I think, uh, has been uh, really beneficial to everyone. Oh, it's been incredible to learn from your group as well, and we really appreciate it. Great. So now looking into the future a little bit, what is an area um, within optogenetics and neuroscience that you're really looking forward to, that you're excited about? <laughs> well, so uh, excuse me, I'm going to be a little bit speculative and kind of far out here, but um, one of the things that uh, from the moment I first uh, saw one of the first papers on optogenetics, one of the things that excited me most about it was the idea that someday we could use optogenetics to read and write mental states. So what I mean by that is, um, theoretically speaking, using both optical actuators and indicators, so tools that allow you to both control electrical activity in the brain and monitor electrical activity in the brain, uh, what you could do is you could read a mental state that someone is having by recording the neural activity in their brain over a period of time. And likewise, you could give them particular mental states or particular sensations or thoughts by controlling the electrical activity in their brain. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this is far off, but it's within the realm of possibility. Okay. And uh, I think that uh, despite the dystopian potential of it, it also has uh, immense uh, potential for benefits to our society. And it's, uh, it's a technology that I'm really excited about potentially seeing long, long into the future <laughs> in my lifetime. Well, that would uh, certainly be quite something. Yes. Um, Blake, thank you so much for uh, letting us come by and visit your lab today and taking, the time, and taking the time to share about your research. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what the Richard Lab does, uh, you can take a look at the link below to uh, their website. And if you're interested more about the Polygon 400, then uh, you can check out the link for that as well. Thank you so much.